Welcome to the Switchblade Sisters Social Club, a true crime podcast where two sisters exploit their worst fears for your entertainment. You're welcome. I'm Dee. And I'm Rhonda, and together we are the Sake Sisters. For more information, check out our website at www.switchbladesisterssocialclub.com or find us on Instagram and Facebook at Switchblade Sisters Social Club. Thanks for listening. Hey everyone, welcome to Switchblade Sister Social Club, the true crime podcast where two sisters exploit their worst fears for your entertainment. You're welcome. My name is Dee. My name is Randa. I know we say all this in the intro, but I just feel like I listen to so many podcasts where there's more than one host and I can not tell the difference between their voices. Oh my God, so, I can't tell the difference between our voices when I edit I know, audio. I know. So, um... I just thought the more times we introduce ourselves, the more it might help. Yeah. Uh, or you can refer to our cushion, <laughs> which I'm pointing to now. I realize that's not very helpful in an audio format, but we do have this cushion and, of course, our mug. And, um, of course, all our merch is available on our merch store. So do check that out. Um, SwitchplaySistersSocialClub.com. Again very repetitive apologies um I want to tell a funny story before we get started on the crime part I love a funny story it involves you I'm telling the listeners oh oh what did I do oh it was just funny because yesterday we were in the car you and I and we had Paul on speakerphones (laughs) Paul being my fiance and also our podcast uh, producer oh (laughs) so grateful oh my god I can't even tell you how yeah I can't even begin to tell you how my Stress levels has reduced knowing that audio editing is no longer a job for us. That being said, Deanna's been doing it for like every episode. I actually love doing it. The problem is it's just so super time consuming. And the other thing is we interrupt each other all the damn time. So I know. And that's what made me laugh because Paul was teasing you. Paul is a joker. Paul was teasing you. I don't even remember what he said, but you were like, Paul, I'm going to get you back by interrupting D so much. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Oh, mm -hmm. God. I'm so annoyed. The background. Yeah. So much so that you have to do even more editing. And I just thought, what a hilarious, passive aggressive way to get back at someone. Very niche. <laughs> but like if you ever niche market. <laughs> if you do ever have beef with your podcast oh, producer gosh. or editor, then uh, that's the way forward. Constantly interrupt and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, every five seconds when the other Because if you speaking. podcast, you know that um I mean the interruptions are kind of natural, especially when you've grown up together as sisters but when you're telling a story and you've got someone in the background and we all do it going mm-hmm, 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 do you mm-hmm, know what mm-hmm. I do it to show you that I'm still listening because I you know can't, you can't take for granted that I'm fucking listening <laughs> no <laughs> and I never do so I appreciate it <laughs> but w- something that's so natural and welcome in normal face-to-face conversation is just incredibly annoying to a podcast listener, I think. And I'll be honest, I only realized how annoying I was when I had to edit some audio and I was like, shit, I'm fucking annoying. And I just need to shut up sometimes. So yeah, it was a really useful experience, but I'm so glad we got Paul to edit our audio and I don't have to listen to myself more than me to. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, put your phone on silent. It is now. <laughs> Can't say I won't look at it, but it's on silent now. <laughs> Speaking of annoying habits. So uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, listeners, for putting up with our our annoying quirks. Don't we don't tweet you. them. We don't we don't need to have attention drawn to them. We're very aware of our own faults. Yeah, we, have we are self aware. We that's the thing about us. We are self aware about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, <laughs> we know. I mean, and if we don't know, one of us gonna tell the other. That's for sure. Probably you telling me. Um, and <laughs> I am in weekly therapy where i do get an hour to sit and talk about oh this is the all thing. the bad things yeah do you talk about me don't 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 ask that we we have no well, you don't come up much oh that's good that's good yeah um, oh no that's good i tell paul um basically having therapy i'm having him his therapy like by proxy because a lot mm-hmm. of it is about him for those of you that also don't know about paul um he's been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder fairly recently although he's for sure had it for ages and ADHD um which I think I diagnosed him with Mm. on our first date maybe even before that (laughs) so um 
and yeah, something quite cool. I'm really excited about uh, writing an article for uh, Women Who Rebrand, which is a really awesome website. And do do Google it, check it out. And um, I'm writing an article on being the partner of someone with borderline personality disorder, wow. which is also hopefully relevant to anyone who has a partner or a loved one, a close loved one who has got mental health issues. And, you know, like one of the things I will say that I really can't get over how it's been normalized for me and just mm. become a normal thing is that, so Paul has really, really dark days. He is like the life and soul of the room and the party when he's on form. Um, you know, he's funny. He's fucking hilarious. Like that boy cracks me up. Mm -hmm. He's a funny the... guy. Can't understand half of what he's saying, but he's fucking oh, funny. <laughs> he's hilarious. Like he, oh, he's English born and bred, but he's got such a strong London mm. accent that we have to translate him for my parents. <laughs> he needs subtitles. <laughs> he really does. Um, we'll get him on the podcast at some point, but at the moment, because he's still coming to terms with his diagnosis and everything, he's struggling to be more public. Um, visually and audio based shall we say um but we'll get him on but you know point. what being incognito is his trademark yeah all right so maybe like banksy. Like banksy. <laughs> maybe i'll get him on in, in disguise or something but for example when he's up he's up and when he's down he's fucking down mm -hmm. um so that is part of the borderline personality disorder and it's getting better because he's seeing a much better doctor than he had before. He's getting treatment. He's getting therapy, like all the things that you really should be doing um, or investigating and researching if you have any concerns about your mental health. And, but before he was having like what we call his dark days, maybe three, four times a week. And on those dark days, he would just regularly talk about ending his life. And it was just it's so weird because I would tell someone about that and they're just like how the fuck do you go on about with your day when mm. your partners just said they want to end their life and it's like I, I don't know it just got so normal and you just have to because I still have to go to work and still have mm. to pay the bills and still have to you know look after him and so yeah it's just amazing when you're in that kind of situation the kind of things that get normalized and become so you get not desensitized that is the wrong word because it's still traumatizing to hear those words from someone you love but maybe normalized is the right word mm. like you just have to learn how to live with that um I and mean, hopefully you get progress and and you seek help and, and it improves but yeah so um if anyone who's got any partners or loved ones family members close friends that have any kind of borderline personality disorder depression that kind of thing we're here for you we are and you know what that's one thing i like about having this platform is that we do veer off and talk about all sorts of things we talk about politics we talk about gender inequality we talk about all sorts of things and i specifically talk a lot about autism because my kids are autistic and you know that whole thing you know even obtaining a diagnosis and getting them into the right school you know you are often i think you know when it comes to mental health conditions um which autism is autism isn't it's a neurological condition but those as well i think there's so much misunderstanding and myths surrounding it and um you're often i'm going to use the word gaslit but because a lot of doctors don't really understand it i spent two years going to doctors saying, look, my kids are autistic. I know what it looks like. I was a teacher. I worked in an autistic school. We have autistic people in our family. We have autistic people in Jim's family, my husband's. You know, almost all their cousins are autistic. I, 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 I recognize this. And you are really dismissed as um, an overanxious parent, which I am that too. But um, also a lot of autistic adults, you know, 80% of women who are autistic are only diagnosed when they're adults because they are diagnosed, misdiagnosed as having anxiety or bipolar. And really you need to get past the GP stage and see a specialist because my son was discharged. They didn't believe that he was autistic despite doing various assessments. And he's now in a specialist autism school. Had he stayed in a mainstream school, which I'm not an advocate for, not even for kids who are neurotypical because you know I left teaching out of principle because I don't agree with the whole system in the UK at least. Um, Finland has a great system. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you know, getting past stated, that GP stage yeah. though is tough. And that's the problem we have with Paul. So uh, the one thing I would say is if you're not happy with the GP, if you've got the possibility of seeing another GP in your surgery or changing GP if necessary, then just fucking do the it. The only way I've got, you know, the right support, the speech therapy, the occupational therapy, the specialist school and all the rest was by being a fucking pain in the ass and f advocating for them and arguing and literally being an absolute nuisance because you will not be handed any of this on a plate so you know i'm glad that we have this platform to be able to talk about these things because i think a lot of people suffer in silence a lot of parents i know who are in the same situation as me didn't know what to do were much more polite than me or just didn't know yeah. what the fuck to do because nobody tells you you have to find and out because you think these are people in positions of authority doctors and counsel yeah, related the people education thing. people the frightening thing was that even when we got past the gp stage and saw a pediatrician they still discharged Che and said he wasn't autistic despite all the evidence. It's only when you see a specialist autism practitioner that they know what they're doing. So that would be my advice. In Just that keep field. on. If you know something's not right, keep fucking going. And even if they diagnose you with something and you still don't believe that the medicine or whatever treatment plan or that they give you is not working, then go back. Because sometimes they go with like the most obvious or common answer and if that's not the case then they might go back and look at your case again mm. but like with paul honestly we i made him finally change doctors so he went from a doctor who was like proper old school doctor and i have some experience working in um doctor surgeries as a receptionist granted but you get a different vibe for different doctors and mm. they all have different specializations so look into that what have they mm further specialize in is a gynecology is it mental health blah 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 so paul has gone from a doctor who literally does not think that mental health issues in men is a thing yeah. his own words to someone who's specialized in mental health issues for men so you yeah. can imagine the different treatment he's going to get so yeah just if keep pushing only the baby that cries gets the milk only the squeaky wheel gets the grease or whatever i don't know <laughs> <laughs> we come from foreign parents so we always get our metaphors mixed up but you know what i mean yeah. um as my favorite murder would say fuck politeness that goes with any kind of crime things yeah. as well we I'll get it into what. crime all the time don't you where like missing persons cases where it's, you have to be on those people all the time you, for them to keep the on being interested in your case do you know what being polite has not served me well whereas being a pain in the ass as a parent and also when i was a union rep as a teacher has got me very far <laughs> i mean yeah. and that's a, it was a terrible life lesson to learn actually um but yeah unfortunately that's the case but anyway should we talk about something more upbeat and lighthearted, like murder sure um i wanted to tell you that i have been watching more of snapped which i think once upon oh. a time was called snapped when women kill okay i vaguely yeah. remember it being called that but anyways such a good show and i mm. also started watching with my friend lisa we do regular watch parties um um oh fuck cut it out because i can't remember what it's called nightmare oh. next door oh yeah so mm -hmm. um really funny because we were trying to like figure out who the murderer was in the first episode and then we remembered what the series was called which then made it very obvious who the murderer was oh <laughs> Oh, I've been waiting. We've had a little bit of break from recording because life happens. So oh, I'm my God. so okay, can excited. I just tell you, can I just fucking interject, actually? Not to bore the audience, our listeners, sorry. But you know why it was delayed? Because last Friday we had to cancel recording because my kid's school, which is special oh. needs autism school, got broken into. Now, considering a lot of these kids are nonverbal and rely on communication aids like iPads, you know, um, like Stephen Hawking uses, that type of thing. If that, if their school got broken into five fucking times. The first time, they stole everything. All the communication devices, computers, everything. Then they came back four fucking times to vandalize a special needs school. And you know, the thing is, there's so many people living in poverty. Even here in the UK. Even, even in this country. So I always think if people steal, okay, they probably needed it more than you. But that is not the case when you're dealing with special needs kids who rely on communication devices. So we had to cancel recording last week because the kids were home because they couldn't go to school because all the windows were fucking smashed up and everything had been stolen. So yeah. did they think it was the same people who came back to? Yeah, Bandalore? they know it. They saw. Yeah, they saw on cameras. Yeah. So they yeah. managed to get away with stealing all the stuff, and they still came back to vandalize, which for me is like Four a more different times. kind of. Yeah, different what? type of crime altogether. Yeah. 
four. And they came back five times in total. So now there's a police car outside the kids' school all the time. That's mm. horrifying. I mean, yeah. I don't believe in hell, but if I did, I would want a special little place there yeah. reserved so speaking for people of... who steal from any school, let alone a exactly. special needs one. Yeah. So speaking of true crime, that one fucking happened in our lives. But let me tell you about another true crime of the day. It's the big reveal. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, you know the story because you drew my attention to it. So you know the story. I don't know know most of them. Okay. So what happened (laughs) was on the morning of March the 12th, 2011, police were called to a Bethesda, Maryland, Lululemon store. (gasps) <gasps> I know, you know, oh you know. my god the lululemon murders yeah this one I'm, I'm telling you this one's by far the most fucking brutal it shocked me researching it right so they were when I, the I, store. can i just sorry can i just say when i mentioned this one to you you had no idea about it no did you no. and it no idea fucking I lululemon were, i mean i know like can i can we just agree like i know a lot of our true crime crime fans might have heard of this there have been some podcast episodes covering it and so forth but haven't lululemon done an amazing job at like keeping this on the down low like (laughs) when you think lululemon unless you're like us and proper fucking crime buffs you don't automatically think oh lululemon murders oh my god lululemon leggings do you know what they come amazing marketing team yeah they come up on my facebook and instagram ads all the time i can't buy from them anymore because honestly i hold them partially responsible and I will tell you why. So, the police were called to the store after a member Wait, of staff. 2011? Yeah. Okay, so not even that long ago, really. No. Can I fucking finish? I don't know. I'm not even letting you start yet. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> they were called to the store after a member of staff found two Can of I finish? Co- <laughs> Can I finish? Can I finish? Okay, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's a South Park reference <laughs> for people our age. <laughs> So after a member of staff found two of her co-workers blood and both unresponsive in different rooms, there was blood fucking everywhere. So one had been sexually assaulted and one was brutally killed. So as detectives investigated, they soon realized it was not as it seemed. Now, 29-year-old Brittany Norwood was a college football star. Her co-worker was Jaina Murray and was a graduate at Johns Hopkins University doing a business master's. Jaina was described as very bright, loving, and compassionate, and devoted to her family. So, Jaina and Brittany were working on a shift together late in the evening. Colleagues said they always got on and had a good friend, well, a good relationship, maybe not a friendship. After they finished their shift, they closed the store and both left the building. But before they close the store, they have to complete a store closing security routine. Each employee would have to check each other's bags to make sure nothing was stolen. I know this is fucked up. Okay. So I personally think this is wrong and that sales assistants are not security guards and that this is why we have CCTV. I mean, I think it puts what, some... first of all, either you get along well and you'll be like, do you know what? Just fucking take it. Yeah. Or look, just put it back and we'll call it or a put day. you in a very awkward situation. Yeah. What do you do? Then you've got to like report on your colleague. Oh, like, and it puts you potentially in a very unsafe situation. And also, do you trust your employees or do you not? And also just, I mean, it's a big company. You pay fucking security guard, you know? Um, like, you're giving know, them a key to a store, and you're worried, are they stealing, like, a pair of leggings or a vest yeah. top? The system just seems fucked. But anyway, mm-hmm. so, this is also one way to create tension and awkwardness between staff members, and there are so many ways better ways to do that. So, uh, what if, um, you know, like we're saying, what if the colleague has stolen? Are you supposed to perform a citizen's arrest? Um, it just puts too much pressure and responsibility on them. So, anyway... Sadly, on people that I'm presuming are getting basically minimum wage. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, sadly, Jaina finds stolen leggings in Brittany's bag. Brittany then says she bought them from another colleague. So, Jaina calls the employee to verify the story, and the colleague denies it. They both end up leaving the store at 9:45. So, at 9:51, Jaina calls the manager to report the theft and gets on with her evening. At the same time that Jaina calls the manager, Brittany calls Isla Rab, another employee at the store, telling her that she left her trade pass at the store and needs Jaina's number from Isla. Isla gives her Jaina's number and Brittany and Jaina meet at the store. So they go back to the store after they left work. So Jaina, could... Jaina being the one that found stolen leggings in yeah. Brittany's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Jaina could not have predicted what was going to happen next. So the exact details of what happened have never been established. But around this time, after 10 p.m., a few Apple employees from next door 
heard a female voice saying, talk to me, tell me what's going on. And another female voice going hysterical, followed by grunting, shouting, thudding, and dragging sounds. They also heard a high-pitched squeal. They also hear a female voice saying, God, help me, please help me. So why the fuck didn't they call the police, the Apple employees? One Apple employee was concerned and asked security to go and check, but the consensus was that people were just being dramatic. I mean, after hearing all those sounds, just being dramatic. Just go check. What, what are and you And also do? hearing, God, help me, please help me. I mean, <sighs> yeah. So the next morning, the manager, Rachel, arrives at 8 a.m. and knows instantly that something's wrong. The door is unlocked, but she thinks another member of staff must have come in earlier than her. But she sees things out of place and disheveled like a fight had broken out. She starts panicking and hears moaning and backs out of the store to find security and calls the police. She finds someone outside the Apple store queuing up to get the new iPad that was out that day. And his name was Ryan Ho. This is a good guy. She asks him to come back to the store with her because she's scared, which he does. So Ryan goes back to the store. He goes to the back of the store by himself with storages and he is met with absolute carnage. He sees a woman face down with blood everywhere on the floor and up the walls. And then he hears moaning from the staff bathroom. He enters the bathroom and sees the woman, sees another woman tied up, but breathing. He says that he can tell she'd been sexually assaulted. Police then arrive Ugh. quickly. Yeah. Police arrive quickly and they approach Brittany, who is unresponsive. So Brittany's the one that's still alive in the bathroom. She's unresponsive and her hands and feet are bound. They then go and find Jaina, who has horrific injuries and is dead with a bloodied rope around her neck and bloody footprints, a size 14 specifically. So the police conclude it must have been a large man. They also notice that Jaina's trousers had been torn at the crotch, so they suspect sexual assault too. They conclude at the scene that it's a robbery turned into sexual assault. And three bags of money had been taken from the safe too. Um, so just after 8 a.m., the ambulance arrives. As Brittany is being taken to hospital, the police notice that she has cuts to her chest, legs, and arms, and lacerations to her foreheads, um, that her trousers are torn at the crotch, and there's also an injury on her right hand, like lacerations to her thumb. This Brittany, Brittany, the one that's still alive. Yeah. So Brittany is then examined by the sexual assault nurse. They can't, however, find any evidence of sexual assault, but this can occur, um, but this was found to be strange due to the level of severity of the violence of the crime. So they then do an autopsy on Jaina and find she's been attacked by multiple weapons and sustained more than 300 different injuries to her skull. She had defensive wounds and the medical examiner said it was the most defense wounds they have ever seen, literally on every part of her body. She had also been choked by a rope and attacked with up to 10 different weapons. The attacker had used a wrench, a hammer, a box cutter, a knife, a craft knife, and even and even more tortured weapons. Apparently kept returning to torture Jaina with different implements. And most of the implements came from the store toolbox. Even metal racks were used to hit Jaina's head with. Jaina's spinal cord had been severed. Her brain had been pierced, so she couldn't move as the injuries were happening to her. That's oh. like, I know, that made me feel oh. sick. That made me feel sick. That yeah. is like worst fear. Like I, I have once or twice kind of woken up with, I guess, sort of sleep paralysis or something, mm. you know, where you're like still, you're awake, but your body's not yet. I don't really know yeah. the science behind it. And even that is terrifying. So the thought yeah. of like not being able to move your body. I know it's like being in an operation and not being able to move, but the anesthetics worn off. That's what it kind of, oh, it's mm. not a fear. Oof. So this the poor injuries, girl. Yeah. I know this one really fucking affected me researching it because of the, oh, just the, I mean, all murders are nasty and horrific, but this one was intentionally torturous, you know? So, and this person who did this to her, you said that most of the weapons came from the site. So he's just like, looked around and been like, Ooh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that makes it, what I, it, it, I don't know if it makes it better or worse than them bringing their own weapons, but it's just like, yeah. Something weird, gross about him being creative with it. Yeah. So the injuries are so bad that her family couldn't have an open casket funeral. A blood spatter expert came to the scene and concluded that Jaina had been repeatedly struck while she was standing and crouching. The police then focus on Brittany and speak to her on multiple occasions after the attack. She is then portrayed as a brave survivor in the media. 
The detectives speak to Brittany and she recounts that her and Jana went to the store and two men wearing masks slipped in behind them. So Brittany says she was raped and assaulted with a wooden clothes hanger and witnessed Jana being raped, but that Jana resisted and was consequently killed. So immediately a manhunt is launched and a, a $150,000 reward is offered to anyone who can help catch the perpetrators. Who would have thought financial rewards would uh, help solve crimes, huh? Do you know what? Always that's actually a re- Sorry, that's actually a really, really large one because like most of the ones that have popped up in our cases have been like 30,000 mm. or whatever. But so. you know what? I always think like it makes me feel a little bit nauseous that people need money to go and help solve crime do you know what i mean uh i i agree sorry i'm just touching up my lipstick because where i've eaten some crisps you can see (laughs) um but um yeah i agree because you'd hope that people would do that out of the goodness of their heart (laughs) and i i suppose there are some cases where coming forward with some kind of clue is a risk for the Mm. person so maybe it's like trying to tip the balance in favor for them Mm -hmm. coming forward i don't know but it's just it's heartbreaking so on the 14th of april the police go to speak to Brittany again this is about a month after the crime she explained that one man attacked her and the other attacked Jaina. she said based on his voice he was in his mid-20s white and around five foot five apparently during the attack he used racially abusive terms and referred to her as a slut apparently Jaina's attacker was six foot tall and both were wearing ski masks and was also white she says she thinks the reason she wasn't killed was that she was, quote unquote, fun to fuck. She said the attackers knew her Ooh. name. Yeah. She said the attackers knew her name and address, and the police said she needs to warn her family. The detectives are still working at the crime scene and find Jaina's car three blocks away from the store, and they find traces of Jaina and Brittany's blood in the vehicle. So this is hmm. where things change a little bit on the gear stick, handle, and steering wheel so this changes the course of the investigation completely and they go and speak to local shops and staff they then find out at this stage of the investigation that Brittany was reported for theft that night of the incident they now realize and i don't know why that didn't come up sooner like why the manager of lululemon didn't report that to the police i wonder if he was like oh bless her she's been attacked she's in hospital she's a hero victim i'm not gonna raise the fact that she stole leggings or Mm. whatever but wouldn't you be afraid to hold on to that key bit of information i know i would be like let me just tell you everything and you decide if it's relevant or not (laughs) exactly so they now realize something is up and bring her in and they don't see her as a victim anymore they bring her in and get her to explain what happened with the two men again they ask her what type of car Jaina drove, and she said she didn't know. They ask her if she's ever been in the car with Jaina, but no, she's that she has been at this stage, and that she was likely to have driven the car due to the blood on the steering wheel. So also the police found it strange that perpetrators came in unarmed, but did not know where to find the but sorry, but they did know where to find the toolbox to use as weapons. I was just thinking that, you know, it's right. not gonna be laying out there, it'll be in a cupboard. I mean, I suppose they could have looked for it and maybe it wasn't that difficult to find, but it, it's a bit You know, weird. and the thing is, if people came in to do a robbery, like, I know sometimes robberies go wrong and, you know, robberies can go wrong and people can get killed, but this was not just a normal killing. This was a fucking torture, you know? Yeah, it's not like one. they, like, hit them on the head to make them unconscious and then run away with yeah. the goods, is it? yeah. So they also highlighted that the way she was bound with her hands above her head could have been done by herself. Normally people would be bound with hands behind their back um, to not let them struggle. So that's Brittany. Also, when they compared the wounds Jaina had with Brittany's, there was a huge disparity and Brittany's were superficial in comparison. So they questioned the police why the allegedly racist perpetrators killed Jaina and not Brittany. Because this didn't add up to Do you know what? I forgot all of this. Mm, Yeah. Go on. So they also raised the question of why Brittany, having only superficial wounds, stayed in the shop for so long after the attack and didn't try to get help. Yeah. I mean, I'm still wondering why it took them a month to work out a lot of this stuff. I mean, I I feel like this would have been a pretty big deal in this area. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. These questions kind of should have been raised a little earlier. So, um... Do we know what also, ethnicity they are? Who, the perpetrators? Well, the Brittany and Jaina. So Brittany's African-American, Jaina's white. 
So there were only two sets of footprints, Brittany's and the size 14 shoe. And considering she said there were two attackers, there was no evidence of another man's footprints. So the police really start viewing Brittany as the I'm killer. just going to, sorry, I'm just going to throw out there. She said the taller guy was six foot, mm -hmm. size 14 feet. Oh, wait, this is American size 14 probably, huh? Mm-hmm. Cut that out. Why, that what was your a... point? I was going to say, if it's UK size 14, that's pretty large foot for a six foot tall guy. I feel okay. like, like Paul is six foot one-ish and he's a size 11. Okay. But cut yeah, it all out. You got a fucking detective brain. But anyway. it's, it's size 14, American is probably... Yeah, it is American It's sizes. a couple, it's a size or two smaller. So maybe, yeah, whatever. Anyways. So... Should I read that sentence again? Also, there were only two sets of footprints, Brittany's and the size 14 shoe. And considering she said there were two attackers, there was no evidence of another man's footprints. The, the police at this point really start viewing Brittany as the killer and start to interview people who know her. So they think she was the killer? Yeah, at this point, that's what it turns to. Oh, because my mind, and again, I must have known this at some point, but in my mind, I was thinking she knew the attackers, but they okay. thought she was... The, I thought yeah. she had got, like, a boyfriend in for revenge or something, but mm. they just went straight to, nope, it's her? Yeah. Woo! Okay, well, go. Well, you know, because the thing is, her blood was on the steering wheel. She said that she didn't know what car Jana drove, but her blood was on the steering wheel, so that was a lie. No, but I feel like that is easily explained away, in that someone had who anyone who'd been in there would easily have got both of their blood on them. Yeah, true. So that, that to me is like not the most suspicious thing in this story so far, but yeah. I, but I, I guess mean, maybe they, at this point have found apart from that footprint, no evidence really of any, like well, no the DNA other guy, evidence. The, the other, you know, the but other... no, I feel, find it weird <clears throat> they would manage to do all of this without leaving a single shred of DNA. And you True. said that one of them had been sex, well, both of them had been sexually yeah, but... assaulted. And mm -hmm. I presume they haven't found any traces of bodily yeah. fluid or anything like that. Yeah. So Maybe that's why they went just straight to, no, she mm -hmm. staged this. Yeah. Well, they also looked into her a little bit. So, well, quite a lot. So it turns out Brittany is a bit of a liar and has a stealing habit. Not that that means that a kleptomaniac is automatically a murderer, but her boy, yes, her best friend- an escalation, isn't it, from stealing yeah. leggings? <laughs> but her best friend from college told them they fell out because Brittany stole money and clothes from her. Her nickname for Brittany was Klepto. So when she played football in college, her teammates said they used to lock up their valuables because she was really known for this. Um, and Brittany did not mind that people knew this of her. So also her Lululemon managers had reports that she was stealing, but they didn't have any proof. So Chris and Marissa, who's Brittany's brother and sister, called the police the day after they questioned Brittany. And they told police she had with withheld information um, that she had actually been in Jana's car, but she was too afraid so the attackers would come after her because they know her address. So, oh, so for a minute I was thinking those sis those siblings are sh shits for dobbing in their their sister, but they were but trying to help her case somehow. Yeah. yeah. So they tell the police the attackers forced Brittany to move Jana's car, but there was no logical reason that the attackers would have asked for this. Um, she says they asked her to move the car to a different car park and that she had ten minutes and that they would be watching her. She says she saw a police car during this time, but was too afraid to ask for help. Now, so in this story, they just let her out to go move the car on her own? Apparently so. Apparently so. And now we know, based on our Stockholm Syndrome research from We Knew the Moon, that people can do bizarre things when under the control of somebody. And for sure. And if in this scenario, if this scenario is true, I can understand she's in a whole world of fear. But I just don't... <laughs> I, I understand her not going for help more than I understand them letting her just go out on her own. Yeah, exactly. It didn't, doesn't doesn't make any sense. So the police asked why she didn't drive away and get help. Like, why did she go back, you know? And okay, there are reports of, like, people with Stockholm Syndrome that were allowed day release and would still come back. Oh, and well, she was saying that she, they knew her address and they knew where her family lived or whatever. That's why I totally get her. Yeah, why you might be compliant, Yeah. So she says they told her they would kill her if she didn't come back. Um, so the police ask her after witnessing her murder co-worker that she found it safer to come back to the store than drive away and get help. Like after seeing your co-worker be killed, you think it's safer to go back to the people who did that than to like go to the police. Mm. Um, police said that every time they interviewed her, she produced new information or details and 
if her story would change. So eventually, we all made... know that that is suspicious when someone keeps on changing their story. Mm. Mm. So eventually, mid April, month and a half after it happened, a couple, um, yeah, they placed her under arrest. They suspected that Brittany never left her trade pass at work. And that was how she got Jaina to come back um, to meet her. But this was part of her plan to attack Jaina. So Jaina finds out that Brittany's stolen leggings. They both leave work. Jaina reports to the manager. Brittany calls another colleague, Isla, to get Jaina's number to get her to come back to store because apparently she forgot her trade pass. And then all this shit happens. Um, so instead of the theft charge, Brittany... Uh, so instead of, yeah, instead of just fucking getting in trouble for theft, she lures Jaina into a death trap. Um, it may be that she thought she could persuade Jaina not to tell the manager about the theft. So it could be that murder wasn't plan A. Oh, um, but do you know what? If someone l- longed to be back into work, it, it, you know, after I've left and gone home, dragged me all the way back. I would not be in a receptive mood to chat no. about it. Do you know and, what I mean? Yeah. So it could be that she lured... Jaina back just to convince her not to report it, but Jaina by this point had already reported it. Um, so not that happened, it mattered because that manager only told the police about that like a month I later. Oh, fuck's sake! So Brittany had time to plan all this. So remember the security officer at the hospital who noticed the cut on Brittany's thumb? He was a yeah. former army medic and said this sort of injury happens when you're holding a knife and it slips from your grip and slides down your hand. Yeah. So. The Texas concluded that it was self-inflicted, that she created her own injuries and made the footprints herself with that size 14 shoe. There was no man there, and that she apparently moved Jaina's car because it was double parked, um, because Jaina came back to the store thinking she's only going to be there for a second, so she double parked her car. Um, and so Brittany moves Jaina's car because it was double parked and would have alerted people to the fact that something was wrong because she was parked only temporarily. This gave Brittany 10 hours before store opening to stage a robbery, move things around the store, open the safe, remove the bags of money, like tie herself up and wait, wait overnight. To how does discovered. Klepto know how to get into the safe? <laughs> like I mean, they don't... don't all staff know how to get into a safe? Not necessarily. Normally, they have to. Ca- I thought they had to cash up and put it in the safe. Yeah, I guess it depends what the procedure is, but it just well... seems weird <clears throat> that she has access to the safe. I mean, maybe maybe Jaina was the one with the keys, or I don't know. No, but do it know just what? seems I think, weird. They don't. I think they, they do don't have trust you one hundred percent. They don't trust you one hundred percent. So you have to have your bag search at the end of each mm. shift, but you have access to the safe, or maybe. Well, that's do you know what? Why? From having temporarily worked in retail, and knowing other people who work in retail, whoever cashes up usually puts money in the safe. I mean, I work in my friend's shop sometimes, and it's a totally different setup because whoever's working there is working on their own usually each day. So we do have like access to the safe or whatever. So I just it that's why it's so alien to me because she trusts us enough to open up, to have keys to the shop, to be in there mm-hmm. on our own all day long, to cash up, to have access to the safe, blah blah blah. You know. So, and if she didn't trust us to do any one of those things, I don't think we'd be working for her. Mm-hmm. So that being said. So- it's controversial to leave one person in the store because of robberies. Safety issues. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And obviously she's not a multi-million transnational chain, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you're not going to know all those staff members as intimately, you know, or as well. Mm. But yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. So, yeah. So this whole thing. So she she opens the safe, got the money out. Yeah. Where, wait, where did she put the things? Where did she okay. put this? The shoe and the money. Well, I don't know where she hid the money, but it was... Okay, so basically, it gave her 10 hours to stage a robbery, move things around the store, open the safe, remove bags of money, buy, like tie herself up, and wait overnight to be discovered. You're right. I don't know where she put the bags of money. <laughs> she might have driven them somewhere when she went for a little drive. Possibly. Yeah. Funny, because that never came up in my research. Like, did they find that money? Um, so this goes to trial and there's overwhelming evidence against her. So Brittany admits she killed Jaina. She says she sat in the car for an hour and a half devising a plan. So they had to decide whether it was first degree or second degree murder. And the the prosecution says it was unquestionably first degree because it was premeditated. The defense saw it differently, the second degree murder, as a crime of passion without premeditation. So even her team were saying it was murder. She murdered. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But not premeditated. 
So Brittany, suspect, her suspected motive couldn't be proven with her defense saying it was hearsay since there was no proof that Jaina was telling the truth about the leggings. Again, CCTV would have been useful. Yeah, that's the other thing. Why do they not have cameras and all? I don't fucking know. Exactly. It raises a lot of questions about security, like, huh? Why don't they do the searches in a place that you could catch it on camera? Why do they not yeah. have cameras on the doors? I'm not saying and why they should... do they not have cameras, to be honest, on 24 hours in the store because of robberies and break-ins? This could have been yeah. solved a lot sooner. I'm not saying they should have necessarily cameras in the staff area. There's, like, questions about, you know, whatever. It's nice not to have but like cameras overnight. on But, your... like, overnight. Do you know what I mean? Overnight, when the store On shut. the doors? On yeah. the doors. So mm -hmm. you can see who's coming in. Did two people slip in behind them? Do you know what? I find it really bizarre that, like, the two people slipping in behind them, like, Apple Store is next door. You would also thought that Apple Store would have good CCTV. Sometimes I'm fucking shocked that there's... I just feel like everywhere in life there's cameras all over. Yeah, so how... but the thing I learned when um, I had an office... I was working at an office and we had a robbery um, and we had just moved in so we didn't have any kind of security uh, cameras up anything like it was literally on our to-do list it was the mm. week that we moved in um and and so fortunately for us we hadn't moved any of our stuff in but the people that we office shared with had a bunch of stuff stolen mm -hmm. we mm. um we contacted next door we contacted there's a pub across the road we contacted next door who had cameras and so forth but all these people are concerned about covering their own mm. doors their own yeah. areas so Do you although know what, though? we could see stuff, it was too blurry, it was too far away to actually be useful in any kind of way. Do you know what? I just don't get it because, like, since we live in a detached house <laughs> and Jimmy's really concerned with security, we got cameras all over the fucking house. So whenever there's any crimes or thefts or robberies on our road, it's not that often, but it happens, people always come and ask for our footage and we capture it all. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, if we've managed to, without just, you know, in-house setup do it domestic setup i don't know why they can't i know it's crazy it's crazy oh and i mean how quickly would uh, that have confirmed or um what's the opposite of the the proven not true what's that well, word you, this is the thing i just don't the have story. sympathy for a lack of cctv because we've got such a good setup here and all we've got is nest do you know what i mean like fucking domestic yeah. system. Just you know? one on the door. At the very least, you yeah. would have thought one to monitor who's coming in and out of the store. Mm. It just seems like a no-brainer. So, okay. Where were we? So they argued, her defense argued that it was hearsay, that the manager could only testify what Jaina said um, about the leggings being stolen by Brittany. The defense, who knew exactly why the argument occurred, wouldn't let this be brought into court. So they said it was second degree murder because of the fact that the argument was hearsay. And you know how in the States, anyone who watched the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case knows how often hearsay comes up yeah. <laughs> in a case. Um, so they argued that the day there was nothing, go that that day, nothing was going on between the two women. Just ordinary day, no argument, no theft. So they continued by asserting that it was a crime of passion, not motive. Um, there was an eight-day trial, and the jury deliberate, deliberated in less than an hour to find Brittany guilty of first-degree murder. So on the 27th of January... This woman, the thing they're forgetting is that she staged it to look like this, like Janae had been sexually assaulted. Jaina. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cut that out. <laughs> They've... They, this woman has staged it so that it looks like Jaina. Jaina has been sexually assaulted. Uh huh. But also, it wasn't just a fucking murder. It was a torture leading up to a murder. A fucking lengthy. Yeah, it's not like, oh, I just hit her over the head once and shit, she died. Or, you know, those yeah. one punch um, this deaths was like, that you hear about. Or I think this is what made it so sickening is that it was like, I mean, I can't think of any other word other than torture. Do you know what I mean? No, oh, yeah. All, all those implements, 300 wounds to every part of her body. This was, she was having a fucking she party. For it, tortured. You know? Yeah. And then thereafter, after this poor girl has been murdered, she then had loads of time to, you know, set up some whatever weird story she mm. wanted to. So it's not like crime of passion, like in the moment, in the heated moment, something mm. happened. So yeah, she was convicted of first degree murder. Yeah. No, so on the twenty no second, so on the twenty second of 
uh, sorry, 27th of January, 2012, almost a year after it happened, she is sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. And this is what the judge had to say, which I find so fucking, so sad, so fucking sad. The judge said, I have no doubt you are a deeply troubled woman. However, my sympathy for your plight does not begin to approach how I feel for the Murray family, Jana's family. You will live. You'll see another sunset and sunrise, maybe through a prison window. There will be a Christmas. There will be telephone calls and visits. The only visits Jana will have will be to her grave. Fucking oh. sad, huh? I know. Sad. So Brittany briefly addressed Jana's family. And <sighs> she fucking can't. Before I go to prison, I need you to hear how deeply sorry I am. I know whatever I say won't take the pain away for the loss of Jaina. My hope for your family is that someday you'll be able to find forgiveness in your heart. I'm truly sorry. Don't believe her. She's an asshole. Yeah. Um, this is and the also, first... stop making it about you. Yeah. Anyway, this was also the first bit of remorse she ever showed. You know, we're talking almost a year later. But Jaina's mother believes this was just to reduce her sentence. And uh, this is another thing that fucking killed me. Jaina's mother, Phyllis, said that losing Jaina was like a pain that ripped through their bodies. The grief is like a lightning strike. So Jaina's sister-in-law spoke about the impact on the family and said, she said, there is no hope. There is no joy. There is no true laughter. So that's the fucking story. And my final thoughts on this is that the tragic truth is that this was a senseless murder. You know, it, it didn't need to happen none do but this didn't need to happen and it was over something so silly like a pair of leggings do you know what i mean that's what's so fucking sickening it's about a pair of fucking leggings and it just turned into <sighs> anyway, that, uh, it's I don't just know it's shocking isn't it yeah and i'm obviously i'm so angry with britney but also to be honest with you when i think about the whole story lululemon what the fuck why if they, why do they have this policy of people having to check each other's bags that work there that's wrong where the fuck is their cctv where the fuck is their security you know i'm also angry at the i mean it's employees. not even like a manager checking the employees bags it's like your co-workers self, your police your, your peers, peers. Yeah. yeah apple employees if you hear somebody screaming grunting and saying please god someone help me what the fuck are you doing just minding your own business call the police even if you don't want to go fair enough call the fucking police why call would you the call the police oh yeah. i totally get why they wouldn't go this was the states everyone's got fucking guns but call the fucking exactly police. so do you know what it reminded me of it reminded me of a quote by your good friend the late desmond tutu love him yes your good friend deanna knows him personally knew him personally We'll post a picture on our socials. So it reminded me of his quote, which I refer to so fucking often in this, in this, you know, in this life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to say this day and age, but it's life in general. So sometimes by doing nothing, you're complicit in allowing bad things to happen. Um, and it, yeah, it reminded me of his quote. If you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Now, okay, it's a little unrelated because it's about oppression. But my point is do good things. Don't do nothing. You know? Yeah. By doing nothing, you're fucking bad. <laughs> You know what we should do one day is cover the case of <coughs> sorry kitty genevieve these kitty genevieve who was the lady that was murdered and there was something crazy like a hundred witnesses oh it makes me so angry it makes me angry because me and you are people who can't let injustices we're not okay with things not being okay and i don't I know how people can turn a blind eye and just be okay with stuff because it doesn't affect them, you know? Well, yeah. And this, okay, I totally get that there are some situations where uh, getting involved might uh, might put you in danger. But the case of Kitty Genovese is really awful because basically she, for those who don't know, she got attacked. The attacker came back several times. And this was in a kind of apartment compound. So there was loads of people in their flats who heard the shouting, heard her asking for help and screaming for help, looking out their window, seeing the attack and not calling the police. So those people were in their flats. They were like, you know, they're safe. They're not, you know... Okay, sure, it possibly would have been nice if someone went out to go and help her. But, you know, not saying you should go and confront a murderer in the middle of a murder. But they could have called the police with no harm, no threat to their safety at all. But You know what? Are... That, that story speaks volumes about human nature. And the thing is, there were some people who said, oh, well, we just assumed someone else would have called. Who cares? Call anyways. Just make sure. You know, other people were like, oh, don't really want to get involved in a long, drawn out, like, court case, blah, blah, blah. Fucking just call the police. Like, and you and I, I know you can, you never know how you're going to act in certain situations. 
But I think you and I are both foolhardy enough to Do you know what? I've there. called the police when I've seen things that are untoward. Yeah, Do I have done. Oh, I remember writer. one time, it was really, really awful. I, I think about this girl all the time. She was having like a really aggressive argument on the bus mm. with the guy. And I went up to her and I said, oh, Sarah, nice to see you. Do you want to come and sit with me and we can catch up? And she looked at me like blankly, but I was trying to give her an excuse to get away from mm, this guy mm, who was clearly mm. bothering her. I mean, it was getting really angry, aggressive, mm -hmm. swearing and all sorts. And uh, she was like, oh, shit, no, sorry, you misunderstood. This is my boyfriend. So they're in the middle of a like loud sort of like not violent argument yet or but it, ugh, anyway. So yeah. do you know what? You though? I remember. Do you know what? D, she will. You will fucking run after a criminal like remember oh, years I know ago, what 20 years ago somebody the ran after the court? yeah someone ran after the handbag you fucking chased that bitch down you got her back back I know and, and she... then afterwards I was thinking I changed what was literally a crack addict down a dark alleyway <laughs> over my friend's handbag <laughs> well do you know what I and think to how be long honest... did it take for my boyfriend at the time to come out and check on me um yeah wet lettuce that guy um <laughs> but do the you martial know what? arts expert do you know what? I had another funny incident. Well, it didn't start funny. kind of ended funny. Well, I tried to see the funny side of things. But you remember our, our old block of flats and Khan, the porter, who we used to call Uncle Khan because he was like, he was the porter of our block of flats. But I mean, literally, this guy's like a family member. We don't live there anymore. But me and Dee used to live in the same block of flats, but several floors apart. Anyway, so one night, this fucking drunk guy um, who worked in the office's opposite was literally beating him up, throwing, throwing, you know, throwing him against the wall. And Khan, you know, he was no spring chicken. It's in the 70s now. So we called the police officer, and then we went out there, me and Jim. And then this dickhead drunk guy starts fucking racially abusing me and <laughs> calling me fucking Palestinian this and that. Anyway, thank God, I tell you what, the police were there at that point. They asked me, do I want to press charges? Because they said, look, we consider that racist. Um, but anyway, as it happens, this guy was just released and nothing happened for beating somebody up. So I don't know. I don't have an awful lot so of faith in the in the police force in this country. But to finish off my story, Brittany is now at, at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. She's 40 years old. Um, Jaina's family have created a foundation to remember and com commemorate her life. So that's, do you know what? I don't think that I have a story that cruel coming up for the rest of the season. I got some great shit coming, but this one? It's just when you think of what it what started it. I know. And how and it ended. Clearly, Brittany w was aware that she would lose her job. I'm presuming mm -hmm. that if you steal something, they're not going to give you a second chance. That, yeah. you know, and <clears throat> I mean, I'm guessing she's probably been in trouble with her employers in the past. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's thinking like, oh, I'll, how am I going to find another job? If but I you know what? This, but... Regardless of jobs, this is somebody who's capable. And I always think people who are capable, it doesn't come out of capable of doing something like that. It doesn't come out of nowhere. Do you know what I mean? It's, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's like we were talking about Colin Pitchfork being released. And these people have got something sick and wrong with them. And they are capable of, if you're capable of doing that, like, it's not like an accidental killing. Do you know what I mean? That's a, those are two very different things. I don't condone any, but they're two very different things. This was like, I mean, even in fucking Guantanamo Bay, they don't torture like that. You know, maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs. I did edit an article <laughs> about, actually, you know what? I did edit an article once upon a time, a couple of years ago from a guy who had been a prisoner at Guantanamo Bay. Um, so I did have some inside knowledge. But yeah, that's there, some but... fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. But I just think people who are capable of bad to that degree are bad. I to mean, the like core. you said, capable of torture. I think a lot of us can possibly imagine a scenario where we would be capable of murder, self defense. If somebody did something to your family, I fucking of your family. Dream yeah, yeah, exactly. But a situation where you're torturing someone before killing them and then staging this, like, like massive it's a setup. Sport. Do you know what I mean? That's something else. Exactly. That's something else. Oh, and yeah. going back to the Kitty murder. What was her name? Kitty Genovese? Yeah. Psychologists actually came up with a term, a syndrome for that, where people stand back and watch and don't do anything. What is it called? Do you know? Oh, shit. I used to know it. Let me just There's Google a, it. Yeah. Because it's a thing. And I'll tell you what, I meet more people like that. And you know, okay, so I don't work in the crime field. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'm not a detective. 
nor am I a criminologist or anything to do with that. I'm an ex-teacher turned copy editor and social media manager. <laughs> I'm really not qualified to, to comment on any of these things. But what I would say is when I was a teacher and I was a union rep, and there's so many fucking injustices just in that profession alone, which is why there's a mass exodus. Um, when people are having a shit time at work and are being treated unfairly, and un unfortunately it's usually women, no one gives a flying fuck until it affects them. No one gives a flying fuck. And this is what I have learned in life in general. And I'm a pretty upbeat. Okay, I'm cynical. Maybe not cynical. No, I'm a realist. I'm not a cynical person. I'm a realist. Yeah, I'm a realist. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I do know is that people don't give a fuck on the whole. Don't give a fuck unless it affects them. We know that also from being Palestinian, that people do not give a flying fuck until it affects them. And people's sensitivities and sympathies are selective, you know? So I don't know how I got into that topic, but my point was that I think people inherently are selfish. Bystander effect. Bystander effect, is that what it's called? Yeah. And um, when I was studying psychology at school, um, we learned about that case, but also another example of, I mean, unfortunately, there's so many examples of stuff. It's just this case was particularly shocking because so there were so many witnesses who could have done something at no danger mm. to themselves. But there was another case that we, we learned about at the same time where a lady was getting raped on a Paris Metro platform yes! oh. with 2,000 people on the platform because it was during rush hour in the morning. Oh, and you just think, how the okay, listen, I think we can accept that most of those 2,000 people didn't see or hear what was going on mm. at all <laughs> because they would not have if it was that packed. But there's going to be at least a, a few hundred around them that mm -hmm. will be noticing something, right? Yeah, fucking hell. Honestly, oh. the human nature really... I don't know what's wrong with people. I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. Do you know what? I, I struggle really... to understand people, to be honest, in day-to-day -day life. Like, I'm somebody who wakes up in the morning asking, why? Why do they do that? Why are people like that? I struggle to understand people um, just with their fucking everyday habits. But that, I don't get. Um, I am starting to understand why podcasts like My Favorite Murder end with the fucking hooray, which is where they um, announce good news from their listeners. I know, Dee, that's why I say to you, tell me something like, talk, let's talk about Disney at the end of a fucking episode. Maybe we of... need to, no, because Disney brings me down, uh, like fucking Pocahontas was like 12 uh, and kidnapped. And... But you know, the Aristocats. Okay, the Aristocats. Well, how about we end every episode with like a joke? But then don't we seem insensitive because you just talked about somebody's murder. Yeah, true. And do you know um, any jokes? I don't know any jokes. I, most of them are really fucking sick and twisted. I know. The only um, one that I can think of, it's just the one you're thinking of. We can't tell. <laughs> we'll get cancelled. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not racist jokes. Oh, no. No, I, those aren't even funny. I don't, I don't, like don't find them funny. funny. I don't find toilet humor funny. You no. Know, you know, I'll tell you the thing about jokes is that, like, in life, probably only about four people that I find funny and I struggle to laugh. Like when people tell me, oh, watch it. We talked about this before. When people say like, watch yeah. this comedy, it's really funny. I just don't find it. It takes a lot oh. for me to laugh. But you are one such person that makes me laugh. Oh, you make me laugh. Um, do you ever watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? No, I don't. It's... We talked about this like a couple weeks ago. All right. But I'm okay, gonna, right. I'm gonna. We had a whole like fucking <clears throat> chat about that. All right. I'll tell you what, let's open it up to the listeners. How can we end our podcast episode so it's not just, and that was all the murder. Bye. Okay. Yeah. I'll put, I'll all do right. a poll today. I'll do a poll today. I'll do yeah. a poll. Yeah. Because I don't know. I mean, I could get Lola up here, but that's not very audio based. She's super I know. cute. This though. is the thing we talk about. We just like, I feel like we put you in a bad mood and then we say bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Maybe we get people to listen to our podcast backwards. Or we record it backwards and we move the sections around and we end on what we've been watching. I don't know. Yeah, give and us they ideas. all live happily ever after. The end. That's all how right. we'll end it. On that note, we're going to end it. Let's go smoke. <laughs> That's what we're waiting to do. Not cigarettes, mom. <laughs> Just crack. Bye. <laughs> don't do crack. We were talking about that. Hey there. Thanks for being a loyal listener. Do you need a new website or want to boost your social media performance? Or do you hate podcast editing? You've tried optimizing your website and social media channels, 
but you're still not getting the listeners, downloads and engagement you want? We, the Safi sisters, love helping people with tasks that they hate. We know a thing or two about podcasts, websites and social media, and we love working with other podcasters and business owners. So why not head over to SwitchbladeSistersSocialClub.com and go to our Work With Us section. We believe in collaboration over competition. A rising tide raises all ships. Bye!